Welcome to your College Bound Kid. Podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. You want a quality education that will give you a skill set that will make you marketable for the jobs of today and the jobs of tomorrow. I am Mark Stucker, and I'm a college coach from Metro Atlanta. And I am Anika Madden, and I am a parent also from Atlanta, currently in North Carolina. And I'm David Williams, and I'm a dad from Chicago, Illinois. Today is Thursday, March 26th. This week in the news, Mark and I will be discussing an article, How Coronavirus Could Affect College Admissions. Mark and Anika will be discussing part two of how can you find merit-based scholarships from the colleges themselves. Mark and Anika will also discuss our question, which comes from Dan in Maryland. And Dan wants to know, what are my son's options if he accidentally submitted the wrong personal statement to one of his colleges? Mark will be in his final part of his interview with Idan Shahar the founder of Test Innovators, and they will be discussing what is misunderstood about standardized testing. And finally, Mark will be going to Rhode Island for the second time to do a college spotlight as he and I will be discussing Brown University. Good morning, friends. Good morning. There is a lot of things going on right now. Uh, first, I'll stick in the world of admissions and give an announcement. And I have to thank Natasha from California, who brought this to my attention, that Chapman University is going test optional. So tribute to Anika, who said, can you announce every new test optional school? That's a pretty major school, uh, Chapman. Are you familiar with Chapman at all, Dave, or not? No, that's one I have not heard of. Well, I'll be doing a spotlight coming up uh, in the not-too-distant future on on Chapman. Yeah, Chapman is a hot school on the rise. So that's a, an announcement in the world of college admissions. And then for our admissions tip this week, you know, I've said before that families overlook outside scholarships as a great tool and a great source of additional money. These are merit-based scholarships that come not from the school themselves, but from civic organizations, corporations, churches, philanthropists, foundations. However, there is one type of outside scholarship I want you to avoid. And this, I could have made this a double thing. I could have made it the word for the day also, but I won't. And this, but it's what we call sweepstake scholarships. Sweepstake scholarships. And what these sweepstake scholarships are, are ones that say, just put your name, your address, your contact information. It's all you have to do. And we will have a drawing and we give away $10,000. $10,000. And what people don't realize is, while well, it may be true, they give away $10,000, but they collect 100,000 names and then they sell your information to somebody else to telemarket you. And I've yet to ever have a client or a student at KIPP or even meet anyone that actually won a sweepstake scholarship. So avoid sweepstake scholarships. That is my tip of the day. And my admissions vernacular, the word of the day is wink letter. Wink letter. Want to guess on that one, Dave, or pass? Your choice. Oh, I think I know this one. Tell me what a wink letter is. I, I think that's before you are actually admitted, you get a letter that sort of gives you a heads up that they think that you're going to get in. It's sort of like a wink and a nod, like, by the way, we read your file, we know who you are, and we like what we see. Bingo, bingo, winner, winner, chicken dinner. That was spot on A++. And I had the cutest thing happen to me this week, Dave. It was so cute. It's a client I worked with in Florida. And they forwarded me, which was a week letter, you know, and it's for Duke University. And of course, and I said, this is a week letter, not realizing that, you know, in the mind of the student, well, Duke is supposed to be announcing the decisions on you know, such and such state. Why am I getting this two weeks early? And so it was so cute. She said to me, what does this mean? I was like, oh my goodness. I realized I get the joy of telling you you're in. I said, can you take a phone call? So I got to call and feel like I was Santa Claus and tell it, 
explain it to her. And she was like ecstatic. Her mom was ecstatic. They were screaming. They were jumping around. Of course, regular admission she had applied to Duke. I'm going to actually read. This is actually Duke's link letter. I can read it. It doesn't mention any name here, so there's nothing confidential. The same link letter would go to everybody. Here's how it reads. Greetings from Duke University. We have some very good news for you. The admissions committee has reviewed your application, and I'm delighted to tell you that among our nearly 40,000 applicants, yours was among a small number that stood out for us. In recognition of all you've accomplished, we wanted to contact you a little early to let you know the admissions committee enthusiastically expects to formally offer you and a member of the class of 2024 later this month. Congratulations. In addition to having access to all that Duke offers in its students, you will be given priority in registration, selection for special program, and it goes on and on and on. And it also, what it does is, it, I'll, I'll read one more thing. It says, I also want to let you know about Blue Devil Days, our on-campus program for admitted students and families. A formal invitation will be included in your admit packet. They are planned for April 9th, 10th, and April 2021. If you, you can select either program. Now, because of what's going on with Corona, those are probably going to be canceled because we'll be talking about that later today. All these programs are being canceled, but that was what, four days ago that happened. And of course, uh, many of our listeners may not know, but Dave and I do record these seven, eight days before they go live. And this one's even a little bit more. So any idea, Dave, why a school would send a wink letter? Well, first of all, that was one heck of a wink. Uh, <laughs> they might as well just sent the, <laughs> sent the, the fully paid the plane ticket <laughs> as well as a Blue Devil shirt. <laughs> I know, <laughs> and, you're right. And the first check for college <laughs> tuition. <laughs> you're I mean, right. That's, you, why, that's why when she sent me a text back and she said, what does this mean? I got really happy because I, I assumed she knew she, she was in. And I was like, oh, I get to give you some really good news. <laughs> well, so that was a fun conversation. Go ahead. Why would a school do a wink letter? One of their criteria isn't uh, studying nuance or subtlety. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I, I got to <laughs> think that they're just trying to get a heads up on a really hot student before they're nabbed by a rival college. I mean, would that make sense? That's pretty much it. So what yeah. it has to do with is, and first of all, this is extremely important what I'm going to say. The majority of admitted students don't get wink letters. So if you're sitting out here and you know that your child or if you're a student, you're listening and you apply to Duke and you're like, how come I didn't get this? I'm getting denied. No, most admitted students don't get wink letters. But what happens is colleges identify certain people that are extraordinary in their applicant pool, who they really want. And they know that because the student is so exceptional, all of our competitors are, are going to go after this kid hard. And maybe not all, but, you know, they know that the student is going to have some other extremely competitive offers. And remember, even when you're dealing with prestigious schools, they still have a challenging time reeling in the kids that they want because the only kids that they admit also get admitted at their rival schools. And so what they're trying to do is what we call, we used to call, show them some love, show them some love. So by showing you the love and getting you excited and enthusiastic about that school, planning for the revisit, putting that on your calendar. What happens with all the time in this process, David, you can relate to this, is that people guard their heart. They know these schools Absolutely. are super competitive, so they guard their heart to protect themselves from being let down. Now that you know you're in, you can allow your heart to go all full-blown, fall deeply in love with the Blue Devils, and it is a yield tool. It's a way of increasing the probability that this student that they know is going to be highly coveted will pick them over their rivals, and certainly a way of getting their revisit programs on the calendar. Maybe you go ahead and buy the airline tickets right now. Because somebody else who may admit you may have a similar date. Oh, you've already committed. Does that Here's make a, sense? It does. Here's a question. So do wink yeah. letters only apply to regular admissions or do they give wink letters for early admissions? Or that wouldn't make sense because with early admissions, they're only applying to one or two schools anyways. Yeah, they don't do them for early admission. And part of it is the quick turnaround time between when the applications are read and when decisions already go out in the early process. So this is for regular, it's a tool for regular admission. And also, like you said, with early, you're applying, particularly early decision, you're applying to only one school early, right? right? So it's only them. So they're not really worried about competition at that point. Right. But with regular, they are worried about competition because, you know, you might be one of these people who applied to 29 schools for all they know. Right. So yeah. where we come from, we call that the bees, knees, big cheese letter. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Whatever that means. That's a Chicago thing. I've That's never a Chicago that thing. 
Bees, bees, <laughs> big cheese, man. <laughs> I think like, you might need to take over admissions vernacular, man. Coming strong like that. That's right. You What's your bees, your... bees, big cheese letter, baby? You're coming with us. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really cool. A student, and, and they can come in different forms. I had another student working with that got a really cool one, actually from Harvard, but it's a little bit different. It was, uh, you are invited to an admission reception, and and it was it was, a, it was all about the reception. It had more subtlety than this one, but you don't send out something like that for March twenty first date when you're not going to admit a kid because by then files have already been read. That's a lot of times when people don't realize files have been read and rated by the end of February. Sure, into March, there's some committee movement and, mo- and there can be some movement. But when this stuff is coming out and you're seeing dates for it in March, files have already been read. But I'll tell you what is confusing, and this is why this stuff can be so baffling, is just off of, you know, all the mail that Lauren would get, Dave, in this admission process? Yeah. Tons yep. of mail. And you got it. Based on test scores and self reported GPA and all of that. Yeah. Well, some schools can be very, very, very forwarded and leaning and presumptive in their communication during that phase. And that does not mean you're getting it because they have not seen your full transcript. They haven't seen your recommendations, essays, extracurriculars, writing and interviews that they have. They haven't seen any of that stuff. Right. And I remember being very, very mad actually at Harvard. I'll call them out. Uh, as you know, I was working with this a long time ago and they, they're Look at this. This is incredible. And it was a letter that was coming in response back in the fall based on all that stuff. And if anybody would have read that, they would have thought, oh, this kid is a shoe in We have identified you as one of the most extraordinary applicants in our application. We surely hope that you will be applying. And that meant nothing. It just meant they wanted your application. So oh, it can be confusing. So if you're getting this stuff before everything's been submitted and read, it really does. It just means they want your application and you look like you may be someone of interest. Very, very different than if you're getting something like this in the month of March. And also, this is not something that most schools do. This is something that just um, some of the more highly competitive schools do. And so once again, if you're not getting wink letters out there, I don't want everybody to think, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with my kid? Well, for me, you know that you've gotten in when they send you the bill. (laughs) (laughs) yeah but when they tell you these are our blue devil days and these are the dates and put them on your calendar you know pretty good sign like you said that was much more than a wink that's right okay so for all you unsubtle blue devil fans there that now you know if they really love you they will let you know (laughs) yes yes now there's you know we're about to talk about this today in the news but We've been having to call a couple audibles. Dave and I are trying to get to this article on legacy admissions, but there's so much stuff happening around Corona. We addressed it last week at 112. And keep in mind, you know, we record sometimes as much as two weeks early. So um, who knows how bad it'll be by the time you guys hear this. But so many things broke literally just today. In fact, you know, Dave and I, we actually recorded at 112 earlier today. And then I have to give a shout out to Shannon Hart. She sent us a great article earlier today. And I said, Dave, look at this amazing article. This is better than the one we just did. And Dave said, let's do another recording. And so we're back and so much stuff has happened. NCAA tournament has been canceled just today. Uh, Travel ban announced to Europe. All that stuff is going on. And so we all got Corona on our mind. And we're back to talk more about how Corona is going to impact college admissions. Yeah, and and to that point, my wife had a good point that we probably should date stamp this recording. I mean, it is March 11th because the corona information is changing, not just on a daily basis, but on an hourly. And in the six hours since we talked, Mark is absolutely correct. We went from the Dow being down into beer market territory, NCAA announcing uh, that they were all for their games in the playoffs will be in empty venues. And now there is a one-month travel ban. And the only humorous thing is that the only country exempted is England, even though the Minister of Health for England currently has corona. So let's try and figure that one out. Yeah, let's transition Uh, into the article, Dave. But I'll tell you what, I'll I'll say one thing before you do. I know that it's a unique day when the number one email that I received today, by far, 
the number one email I received today were all of these emails from colleges telling me that they were canceling either their tours or their admitted student visit programs. And it just, they just kept coming after coming after coming one after another. One was a tour that I had set up to do with a bunch of students. They sent me a notice saying that they were suspending all tours and others were just general emails that they sent to all the counselors on their distribution list talking, you know, so we could tell all our students and they just came and they came and they came in waves. And first I was like starting to record them. And then I, after a while, I got so many, I was like, maybe I should just assume everybody's canceling everything. But anyway, you want to, you want to transition and do a description of of our article today? Absolutely. Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. Okay, so once again, this is the article that gives the most up-to-date information as we know it today, and this could certainly change. The article was, how is the world of college admissions going to be affected by corona? And they gave about eight different events or likely or probabilities of what could happen. So the first was, number one, expect decisions to be released on time. And it's pretty much said that colleges don't want to delay the decisions. And that's one thing that they'll probably want to get out. Certainly changing that would change a lot of dynamics of the admission process. So that should not change. Okay. Hey, Dave, quick question. Do you want me to comment after each one? Or do you want me to comment at the end? How do you want to do it? Actually, I I think commenting after each one is nice. So, uh, So, So let me just reaffirm that. And I got I got several emails from students I'm working with today about this. Are decisions going to be delayed? I mean, are we going to hear a lot later? Yeah. And the answer is no. And there is, so I agree 100 percent with what she said. And one of the reasons why everything will be, occur on time is because one, almost everything is already done now anyway. Yeah. And what hasn't been done can still be done. Like even if offices are working remotely for the most part, they can communicate through emails and stuff. And yeah. And also, there's a whole cycle on the other end where they they want to get as many confirmations in so they know what they're working with with their class. So schools are already freaking out right now about this. Well, actually, let's talk about that later because that's point number three. Keep going. Okay, no problem. Well, the second one, and we have talked about this, you just mentioned it, is admitted student programs are being canceled amid fears of the fast-spreading virus. So, Mark, you want to dovetail on what you've already told us so far? <laughs> yeah, the one thing I'll say is, you know, I got a call from a school and they said, we're canceling our admitted student visit programs, and a bunch of our competitors are. But what they said to me, we're freaking out because we're really not sure how that's going to impact who we enroll this year. Because we're canceling, and sure, a lot of our competitors are, but a lot others are not. And so if they go to the competitors and they have a great experience, uh, for those of you who don't know this, all schools have these admitted student visit programs. They can be one day, two day, or three days. They're really pretty extraordinary events. When I was doing admissions, we called these all hands on deck events, meaning nobody can take vacation. Everybody needs to be there because every student might have something that's important to them that's very different from another student. One student might want to talk with the director of technology and talk about what's offered. Someone else might want to meet with someone over food service to find out how they're going to handle their food allergies. And I could mention 100 different scenarios. So everybody kind of needs to be there. And these are yield events. These are where all year, they've worked as hard as possible to get these applicants, and these is, this is who they want. So they reel, they trying to reel everybody in. And I can tell you, the landscaping and the flowers, everything gets trimmed, and money goes into making the place like as beautiful as possible. And yes, they do step up the food. If there's food involved. You know, they're going to go that extra gourmet level. Everything is designed to reel everybody in. And so these are these programs, but. This particular representative was telling me, Mark, I'm concerned because we're canceling it. Some of our competitors are, others are not. But what's happened, that was, let's see, we're recording this, like you said, Dave, on March 11th, which is a yep. Wednesday. That's that was right. on Monday. And so from Monday to Wednesday, so many other schools have canceled that now it may not be as big of a deal. But I think I think we talked about that enough. Okay. Well, number three, with great uncertainty, the wait list will be in full effect. It basically says that admission deans cannot take a chance because if students enroll at a lower rate they were expecting, uh, then the wait list will be heavily relied upon. 
So Mark, you've talked many times about how crucially important for colleges to meet their enrollment goals. How is this going to be affected by Corona, in your opinion? Uh, once again, I'm, I mean, I'm literally having conversations with schools are about this right now, and they're telling me, Mark, we know we're going to go deeper in our wait list. There's a lot of things. Some of it relates to the previous point, which is if people are not going to get a chance to visit, then they may be unlikely to commit. And, and, and where in the past they relied on those administrative visit days to seal the deal, and to get people to deposit after them. And right. so there's just a lot more uncertainty. And then there's even the uncertainty of all the stuff we're talking about. Is it safe to go to college? The whole social isolation message we're talking about. I know right. families are going to be saying, you know what? This is a perfect time for a gap year. This is a right. perfect time for a gap semester. Right. You know, those kind of conversations are going to be going on with families. So what happens with schools is they have incredibly detailed yield statistics. And they base how many people they can accept off of their yield statistics. And if you're listening for the first time or you haven't heard this, yield is just simply the percentage of people that accept your offers. That's simple. It's a mathematical formula. If I put out a thousand offers and 500, you know, deposit and enroll, then I'll have a 50% yield. Okay. If 200 out of a thousand enroll, then I have a 20% yield. If 800, then I have an 8% yield. And schools rely on that so they know how many kids to admit so they don't overroll or under enroll. But it's a lot more complex than that. Like they'll know their yield statistics for people that are living in their local area versus people that are coming 500 miles away. They'll know it oftentimes by major, like computer science major versus an English major. They'll know it for different racial demographic groups. You know, they'll know it for kids in certain test score bandwidths. Like, okay, when we admit kids with a 1500, this is our yield, but we admit kids with an 1150. This is our yield. So they have these very, very complex yield models and they rely on that. So they know like how many people they need to admit to not over enroll or under enroll. And basically schools are like, throw all that out this year. It's such a wild card because of either the fear of Corona and people not knowing if it's safe to come into a social environment or the fact that they can't get to come back to that campus and get that. For some people, it's their first time visiting the campus. A lot of people apply having not visited and they were relying on let me see where I get in and I'll see if I feel comfortable on my visits once I get in and I'll make my decision after that. So does that make sense, Dave, why they feel they're going to have to go deeper into the wait list? Well, it certainly does. And it reminds me of our last podcast that when kids have had to take the last semester off, like my daughter right now, she's probably not going to complete the last part of her freshman year. And you were telling me, Mark, that you would feel that you sort of got ripped off because you paid for that freshman year. You paid for the room. You paid for the board. You paid for the college experience. And and now that's uh, all sort of gone by the wayside. So I could imagine that there's going to be a cohort of kids that say, you know what, rather than take that chance of that bleeding into my freshman year, why don't I consider a gap year? Or, you know, I don't have the chance now to really lock down if this is the place for me. Why don't I actually just... Uh, uh, delay the decision until times are more favorable and I can get a better beat on the colleges. So that all makes perfect sense. Yeah. And I'm going to throw in an additional admissions tip for today because it's relevant. Yeah. It's something that happened literally today with the family I'm working with in Memphis. Yeah. They got in some schools, got waitlist, some other schools, I had a session with them and they're like, Mark, what should we do with these waitlists? And here's what I said, you know, it's very important if you're interested in staying on a waitlist that you Affirm that every school that has a waitlist is going to ask you the question, do you want to stay on the waitlist? They used to send like three by five cards and that, you know, no post is necessary to return. But now everything's so electronic that it's almost always going to the portal and do it electronically now. Go on this place on the website, this link. But you need to do that. That's very important. So they right away will find out, okay, who's serious about us and who's not. So if you're on a wait list, you need to reaffirm if you want to stay on the wait list. You want to go to the next point, Dave? Yes. All right. This is an interesting one. Acceptance rates will rise. You had pointed out before that even Harvard University is down 8% in applications from last year. And so with this happening, they actually expect the acceptance rates to rise even more because of the fall in applications. I agree. It basically is all the things that we're talking about. It's the uncertainty of the safety of this time. Should I take a gap year? Is it safe to come into social spaces? I didn't get to visit. It's all those same things again. 
are causing concerns. So we said earlier that throw the yield models out. But what that's going to mostly mean for a lot of schools is that they're probably going to lead with more offers because they know that they'll get more refusals. So if they know, if it's a school that knows that they need to admit 3,000 kids to get 1,000, you know, they have a 33% yield, then they're likely to say, you know what, we know our yield's going to be down. So why don't we go with 3,200? I still think we won't over-enroll admitting 3,200 to get the 1,000 that we need because we know yield will be down, which obviously if you're accepting more, then that means your acceptance rates go down. The only thing I would caution, and I perhaps disagree with the author on this, she said when acceptance rates go down for Harvard, you know they're happening all across the country. So she's basing that on early early admissions data. And it's true that Harvard and a lot of schools, we talked about this on the podcast, they had higher acceptance rates this year than normal. But I don't think we can quite extrapolate yet that because that happened in early round, that that's going to happen in the regular round. And right. remember, Harvard is a school that has single choice early action, meaning they hold all the cards. If you're going to apply early to them, you can't apply anywhere else. And what a lot of us counselors are doing in cases like that, unless someone is extremely strong, we're actually discouraging them from applying to schools that that do that because you blow out all your other options. And especially as more and more schools are giving, counting you as a little thumb on the scale when you apply early action, you're blowing out your chance to show interest to all these other schools. So anyway, that's just a small point that I would disagree with. I think that acceptance rates will be higher because yield models will be lower and they'll admit more kids to get their number, not because Harvard's early action numbers were down and therefore everybody's in trouble. Just a little minor thing. Makes sense. Number five, be ready for colleges to aggressively try to convince students to enroll even after they make a decision. Now, this point actually harkens back to our podcast several uh, podcasts ago about the NACAC decision, which is when the National Association for College Admission Counselors were forced to remove regulations by the Justice Department that prohibited colleges from trying to recruit students after they had already committed to another college. And they said that the uncertainty that we've describing will just exacerbate that trend. Absolutely. So this already happens. The people, once people admit you, kind of like I said, they've worked all year to get you, and now they want you. And when I say this happens, what I meant is schools already get really aggressive at trying to reel in and get students to commit who they've admitted. But now with the NACAC provisions changing and with this uncertainty of yield and with the admitted student visit days being canceled, now you're going to see even more aggressiveness. And it's oftentimes going to come in the form of incentives. So special bonus money if you enroll, special dorms, special perks, special advisors, all kinds of things. I'm expecting all kinds of things. Your study abroad airfare will be covered for you. I mean, all these kinds of things are things I'm going to expect for schools to throw at students as a way of getting them to commit to them and not to their competition. Wow, that's right. Now, number six is actually very similar to number two and uh, makes sense. Campus tours and information sessions are being canceled for prospective students and family of younger grades. It makes sense that if they're going to cancel admitted student programs, then they're, it's also going to impact campus tours and information sessions for the same reasons. Yeah, but this is, I agree completely, but this is really significant because remember, mm-hmm. you can't just focus on your seniors. Right. Like this is the time that juniors and sophomores are using their spring break. I mean, I did a session with the family I'm working with in the West Coast earlier this week, and we went over all their visit plans, and they were talking to me, gee, should we cancel or should we not cancel our big trip that we've planned to visit all the schools that we've been working on together for a long time? And then I texted back and forth earlier today and said, guess what? I don't think you have a choice because everybody's canceling them now. Wow. And so wow. that, yeah, so it impacts your pipeline coming down the road that hasn't even decided for sure whether they're going to apply to you or not. So it's this is going to have ramifications for college enrollment. There's no question. What do we got next, Dave? Yeah, and uh, this is pretty big. ACT and SAT sites are being shut down, not only abroad, but here in the United States as well. I haven't heard that. 
So are they actually shutting down a lot of U.S. ACT and SAT sites uh, that you've heard of, Mark? You know, I have to be honest. This is the first time I've heard this, but stuff's happening so fast, Dave, just in the last 24 and 48 hours. Yeah. I'm sure this is correct. You know? Yeah. I'm sure this is correct. I mean, think about it. Schools are closed. Right. Right. And a lot of times these tests are done at schools. Right. So there's no question in my mind this is accurate. I just haven't read an article on it yet. Okay. And that is going to have ramifications because people yeah. are going to be like, I don't want to apply until I get my scores. I'm not happy with my scores yet. So if I can't take the test, then I'll just wait until I get my scores and then apply. You know, it's going to delay things. Right. Of course, we don't know. We don't know. I mean, you and I, like you said, and I like Frida's idea about time stamping. We're sitting here sharing this on March 11th. Right. And then this podcast actually go live March 26th. So we're, this one is well in advance. Yeah. But, you know, we don't know what, whether we're looking at, are we talking, um, a one month delay, a two month delay, a three month delay on some of this stuff? Or is it like a six month delay? You know, we just right. don't know. Right. And so I think for a lot of these things, whether this, the shutdown is more of a two week to 30 days versus two to three months is good. That in itself is going to have major ramifications. Yes. And, you know, just to add to your point, Mark, we are recording this two weeks before it's aired. In two weeks, we will truly know whether what's happening in the United States reaches pandemic proportions. We already have the example that Italy is a mess, that a lot of places in Europe are on the brink. And because we have not done adequate testing, we have no idea where the United States will be. So this recording could be incredibly prescient. Or we can turn around and say, you know, it's not that bad. But from where we're recording now, it is total uncertainty. Yeah, this is a you know article by Sarah Harbison. I feel like it. The things that she put here, they're pretty safe bets. Like I can't see anything changing in a way to negate everything on here being true. That's it's correct. just a matter of degrees. That's right. Like there's really nothing I think that could change in the next you know on this story. To I mean. Sure, it's possible that if it's more innocuous than we think, that schools maybe will go back to doing light tours. I, I was actually contacted by, I mentioned earlier in the podcast, I'm planning this big tour for a bunch of students uh, for my job at Kip. And I was contacted earlier the day to say that they need to cancel that. But actually, that particular university, actually, they're canceling all their morning tours. For now, their afternoon ones are still going on. So there's so many different ramifications that are out there. and. The point is well taken. You want to share a last point, Dave? Well, this is one we've actually talked at length as well in our last podcast. Virtual classes are replacing face-to-face in-person classes for high schools and colleges. And um, you want to talk about that, Mark, briefly? Yeah, we, you know what? I don't think that we need to say much about that because that was pretty much our last week. This Our focus was talking about how reduced applications from China will impact the budget and how right. colleges are moving more online. So I think we... But the thing I'll say, though, just to show how prevalent this is, literally between like, when we recorded 112, which was this morning at like 7 a.m. and uh, 6 a.m. your time, and now we're doing 113 the same day, but 10 p.m., I had a conversation with my boss at Kip, and she's like, Mark, you're the only one on our team that uses Zoom all the time. Tell me about it. Because basically, everybody's going to be working from home now. So she's going to take out Zoom contracts for everybody so everybody can have Zoom video. And while we talked about virtual classes, and I think this article is really well written, the one thing that I would have added in this article that wasn't here, Dave, is colleges are going to be going to a lot more. um, Zoom is becoming the main player because of the best, but it's video conferencing. You're going to go, you're going to have a lot more information sessions by video, because schools are not going to say, okay, you know what? We can't do tours. We can't do anything. So we're just going to stay at home and watch Netflix. Like, no, they're yeah. still going to do something. And what they're going to do is they're going to set up virtual tours. They're going to, I mean, like schools have virtual tours now, but they're going to have like online interaction stuff. Like I attended one last week that was for counselors. And, you know, it was a school in the Northeast and they're going to this cutting edge model. They're doing six of them a year. I had to yep. do all the survey feedback. So it's still in the pilot phase, 
but it's very effective because you can interact. We can, you can have your questions answered back and forth. This is actually something that I set up now myself. I know admissions officers and I say, listen, how would you feel about me grabbing six students who are interested in your school? We'll all jump in the Zoom room. We can do an, an interaction, a video information session. And I'll pull together six students, like meet your admissions criteria that are interested. I'll pull their parents together. And I've never been turned down on that. They think that's fantastic. I'm actually really surprised how far behind colleges are at proactively doing this. I can't tell you, Dave, how many times when I've said that to a college, they've said, that's a good idea. And like they hadn't been presented with it before. They hadn't thought of it on their own. So it's still new turf for colleges. But I can assure you that is going to happen. and It's going to happen fast. Schools are going to start saying, why don't you attend our virtual information section? You can see us as counselors. You can answer your questions. We'll be right there. You just can't come visit us. Yeah. What are we going to say? And I, I think this is an inflection point. And I think we're going to look back in five years time at this period as a time when Zoom video, online courses, the virtual university completely takes off. And that you're going to look at uh, the leaders such as Liberty University and great question that we talked of as truly being the Amazons of their time. Uh, it just makes too much sense. And as I said before, uh, this will not be the last epidemic virus that we have. And colleges are going to try and protect themselves by having these alternative modes of education in place next time. Yeah, what concern I have is the video conferencing is so effective, the virtual information session, and colleges are under a lot of pressure to reduce their travel budgets. And we've already talked about how this is going to impact schools' bottom line. One thing that I do think is going to happen, and it's already a trend that's been happening, is schools are going to do decreased admissions travel and realize that this virtual, it's not the same as being there, but it's really effective. And is it ever convenient? No airline, rent-a-car, meals hotels, and it's still pretty effective. So my predict you're going to see something. It's not actually that bold of a prediction. Already travel has decreased. If you talk to a lot of schools, they'll say they don't get as many visitors as they used to get, you know, on their travel where they come by. Sure, there are a lot of schools that do travel. There'll always be a bunch that do. But this has been a trend that's been happening for a while, Dave, is where yeah. schools have been spending less on their travel. And I think that they're going to find out that this virtual thing works pretty effectively. And It'll probably decrease some of the travel, but you know, it's just going to be a little incremental here and there. Makes perfect anyway, sense. it was a good article, Dave. Yeah, I thought that this article was a lot better than the last one. And thank you, Shannon, for sending it to us. Yes, thank you, Shannon. And we shall see how this thing changes, but I am sure that we're going to have more twists and turns to come in the coronavirus saga. Now it's time for our step-by-step walkthrough of the college admissions process. Anika, we are in a new COVID-19 world. How is it impacting your life? Uh, Don't say the COVID word anymore, Mark. I'm sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You can't even <laughs> flip anywhere. Radio, TV, it's on everything. It's I tried to flip to... An old mm-hmm. basketball channel they're talking about. It's like, I, I relate, I relate. No, yeah, tell me about your latest favorite movie. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> you know you're stumping me on that one. <laughs> oh, good gracious. Yes, yeah, still I'm crazy. Enjoy, I'm enjoying having Joy home, I'll tell you that. That's nice. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm trying to get Jalen home. You know, he's up uh, up north. And you know, they're about to take down New York. So that's our latest happening. I was trying to get Kara's home. She's in Charlotte, but I think she's like just settling into Charlotte life on me now. Like, mm-hmm. this is my new home, Dad. <laughs> <It's not> the, <laughs> Leave she's me in alone. an own apartment <laughs> lease and all that stuff. So it's not it's not good. that easy anymore. But I hear you've discovered Zoom video over there. At work. Yeah, for work. I told you we're going to probably do this after the virus is long gone because it's so convenient. <laughs> See, that's one thing that's really interesting to me is how will life change after this is over? Because people have gotten used to different habits. Right. And I think teleconferencing, video conferencing is going to be one of the big areas. Um, you know, I don't think all of that will be lost. I mean, sometimes it's going to be convenient to say, hey, let's do a meeting from home. Well, not even from home, from office yeah. to office, because people have to get up and huddle around a, a conference room. People come from like different buildings for that. So annoying. Oh, yeah. You're at a big campus. It's all spread out, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. Well, it sounds like you're surviving, if not thriving. Yes. Do you see, is A&T shut down for the whole year? Or are they saying like two weeks for now and then Mm. they're going to make a call? The year's done. Yeah, they're trying to make a decision on commencement now. Oh, okay. So you've already ruled the year out. Well, he did say it probably, he said commencement probably won't happen, but it's not totally canceled out. See, this is a thing that's just devastating all the students that I'm working with right now. Mm -hmm. Is the thought of like no prom for the seniors, especially my boarding school kids that just bond so much by living in community. Like, they're just devastated. And also my college seniors, too. Mm -hmm. They're just all, the seniors are just really, really having a hard time with it. I'm sure, as they should be. But let's get off this topic because it's like the only thing that's being talked about in life. Please, please, please. Chapter 113. What you got? (laughs) Yeah, so chapter 113, we're continuing our conversation on merit scholarships. We'll actually be talking about them quite a bit, even for the next few weeks. Next week, I'm going to get into where you find Mm -hmm. them. And then the following week, sort of how you're evaluated. But this week, we're continuing to just, you know, do some basic overview content of merit scholarships. Okay, so as you know, Nico, we're looking at merit scholarships. We're looking actually quite a few weeks in a row, merit scholarships, talking about some of the fundamental concepts that go into merit scholarships. This week and last, last week and this week, next week, I'm going to really get into websites where people can go and other sources of data where people can actually find them. And then we'll get into the following week, we'll get into how people are evaluated. But you've read the chapter. What were some things that jumped off the page for you in this chapter? Yeah, well, you first made the, you pointed out where merit between a public school and a private school are similar, where you still have to be like the top five to 10% of the class, you know, or of the applicant pool in order to be considered for the good ones. The huge ones. Yeah, the lar- the largest awards. And then you mm-hmm. said, I think you said the, the top quarter of the class for the lesser awards or the smaller awards. Yeah, and um, let me say something about that, Anika. That's not precise okay okay? it's more the concept is what most schools do that offer merit remember not everybody does Mm -hmm. is they have really really large ones that will go to the very top kids and when i say the class it's their applicant pool Mm -hmm. it's not like oh well i was number you know i was number seven in my class well if you're number seven in your high school class but you're not at the top of their applicant pool that's not what matters so it's not about your high school class it's about their applicant pool right so the largest ones go to the strongest kids in their applicant pool. And then there's normally a tiered structure where there's still merit awards, but not quite as large for students that usually are around the top third, top quarter. And mm-hmm. it varies from school to school, you know, where that line is drawn. Okay. But, and so let me just go into my biggest takeaway from this chapter. And it was how you mentioned that the private schools, the more, I guess, in demand or the more sought after schools are the ones that don't give out as many merit awards. So my question for you is, if that's if I'm reading that correctly, are you saying that in order to go after large merit awards from private institutions, you need to go to the ones that aren't as well known as whatever the brand name private schools are so you can get more merit money? Is that correct? Yes, basically in essence, yes. So as we said before, that merit money is used as an enrollment management tool, meaning a way of enticing people to apply and shaping your class. Mm -hmm. But there is a category of school that doesn't believe in merit money, partially because they have such incredible brand strength with their prestige that people are willing to pay their sticker price. So obviously we're talking about the Ivies because the Ivies philosophically do not give merit money out as a core value. You literally, if one of the Ivy League schools said, we're going to start giving away merit money right now, they'd be booted out of the Ivy League. It's Mm -hmm. at the core of what it means to be in the Ivy League. We don't give merit money. We only give need-based aid. But then there's another group of schools. Some people call these the the little Ivies. They're more accurately referred to as colleges in the NESCAC conference, which is just an acronym. Remember, the Ivy League's a football conference. It's all it is, right? So there's another athletic conference known as the NESCAC conference. And these are schools that are very prestigious, small, selective. And I'll tell you what NESCAC conference schools are. Amherst, Bates, Bowdoin, Colby, Connecticut College, Hamilton, Middlebury, Trinity, Tufts, Wesley, and Williams. Okay, they're also in the Northeast. All right, so it's the culture of the most selective 
schools in the Northeast to give little to no merit aid. Now, one difference between the NESCAC conference and the Ivy League is that it's not a fundamental tenet to be in the NESCAC that you can't give merit. Some of those schools do give merit, okay, in the NESCAC. Connecticut College recently made the change to give merit. But if we go down this list, Amherst doesn't give merit. Okay, Bates doesn't. Bowdoin doesn't. I mean, you know, Kobe, like less than 1%. Okay, Mm -hmm. Middlebury, no, virtually no. Tufts, pretty much no. So Wesleyan, they have one merit scholarship. Williams doesn't do it. Trinity has more, but did so you most say next, one next, merit next, scholarship for that school? Yeah, they have one merit scholarship. In fact, what? Cliff Thornton, my friend there, he says, I don't even tell people about it because we just have <laughs> one. And it's like, <laughs> chances are you're going to get that one or like, you know. Gracious. So, hey, Ivy's got zero. So the point is, that is the culture in the Northeast. That is different than the culture in other parts of the country. But it's still true that the more selective and prestigious the school, the less merit money they give. And that's because they don't need to give it to attract really strong applicants. And mm-hmm. they actually, most of them actually kind of wear it as a badge of honor that all of our money is given away need-based. And that's something to be aware of. And I'll tell you, this can be a challenge. So one of the families I worked with recently, not mentioning location, anything like this, because I don't want anybody to know what I'm talking about. But it was a situation where, the st- I'm not even going to say the gender of the student, but the student, just to be mo- very cryptic, But the student was a very strong student, straight A's, okay? The mom said the most she would be willing to pay would be $55,000 for college. She said, I'm not doing any of these $80,000 schools. But the student wanted to go to schools that were hard to get into. So as a straight A student, the only schools that were, and she really loved the small liberal arts colleges, by the way. So, oh, I said she. I guess I said the gender. I'm busted. (laughs) So much for me trying to be cryptic on gender. We still don't have a clue. Don't worry. Keep going. (laughs) Yeah, that's okay. So the only schools that were intriguing to her were ones that were going to be challenging to get in. As much as I tried to make the case, these other schools, yeah, they're not going to be incredibly hard for you to get in, but they're unbelievable schools. She wanted the challenge of trying to get in a hard-to-get school. So it really presented a challenge for me because – the only schools that were really hard to get in for her were schools like Bowdoin and Middlebury and, you know, and Amherst and Williams and, and Pomona schools like that. And so it kind of, it was a real dilemma because these are all the schools that don't give merit money. And this was somebody who wouldn't qualify for any financial aid. So the financial aid need assessment was going to say, pay the full boat. Does that make sense? Or is that confusing? No, that's clear. Yeah. So that's true for this subset of colleges. Other than that, the overwhelming majority of colleges in the country do give away merit. Mm -hmm. The question is, how much do they give away? That's partly a reflection of how deep their pockets are. I think I shared this story on the podcast once, Anika, where Joy got the largest academic award that Belmont Abbey, which is a school not too far from Mm -hmm. you, by the way. Do you know Mm -hmm. that school, by the way? Mm -hmm. I know of it, yeah. Yeah, it's in North Carolina, not too far from Charlotte, right? Mm-hmm. Their, their largest academic merit award she got, and it was $6,000. It was like a drop right. in the bucket. Mm-hmm. So if school, first of all, has to have money. Then they have to, you have to look at how they apportion their money. Some schools give a lot of small awards to a lot of people versus really big awards to a few. And then you have to be a competitive applicant for it. So that's one takeaway. Anika and I are so grateful for everyone who has financially supported our podcast. It allows us to pay our staff and cover our other auxiliary expenses involved in having a weekly professional podcast. At the start of every month, we're going to start sending a special gift to anyone who financially supports your college-bound kid. I will be sending our donors this bonus content once a month directly to your email. The bonus content will be between 10 to 15 minutes in length. Usually, it will be a college-related topic that I'm passionate about. Occasionally, it'll be another bonus hot topic in the news segment. Sometimes, it'll be an answer to a question that one of our listeners submits to us via email. And you'll receive these monthly audio blogs for a gift of any amount. We know that 5000 to one person is $5 to someone else. And we don't want your budget to be a hindrance to you receiving this additional bonus content. So if you want to support our show, just go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and click the donate button. And if you've already financially supported our podcast, you will automatically start receiving this bonus content via your email. This bonus content is our way of letting our financial supporters know in a tangible way 
how much we appreciate you. And if you have any questions at all about our monthly bonus content, just send your questions our way. That's to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Once again, questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Any other thoughts you have from the chapter? Well, I want to hear the end to this child's story. Like, is it over? Are you okay, still working so you know with what? Family? I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm in the middle of it right now. That's oh, the reason okay. I'm being so cryptic. Wow. I had a meeting yesterday. Good gracious. Yeah. I will, yeah, I had a meeting the... yesterday. So it's one of these things where I'm trying to get the student and the parent on the same page. I'm working hmm. on it. Well, good luck with that. But it shows what can happen. Like, if merit money is really important for you, you need to be looking at schools that offer it and you're eligible for it. Right. Um, there was something that I said in this chapter that to me was really important and we haven't talked about that much before. And it's something mm-hmm. that really confuses and actually really rankles people when they learn about it. And it has to do with the fact that, well, I'm actually going to give an example of it. And I think it'll, it'll make the point a little bit easier. So let's say I'm working with a student and Let's say they're looking at a college that costs fifty thousand dollars in cost, right? Cost of attendance, and let's say their expected family contribution is twenty five thousand. Okay, and let's say this is a college that meets full demonstrated need. So you're thinking, okay, it meets full demonstrated need. My EFC is twenty five. We know the formula: cost of attendance minus EFC equals need. So therefore, I have a need of twenty five thousand. The school will give me twenty five thousand through a combination of grants, loans, and scholarships. Okay, so they're thinking I'm going to get twenty five thousand off of a need based analysis. Then they turn around and read about the merit scholarships the school offers, and they find out oh, there's a twenty five thousand dollar merit scholarship I'm eligible for. This is amazing. This is incredible because I already get twenty five thousand on the basis of need, and now if I can win this twenty five thousand on the basis of merit. I could potentially have my kid go with the full ride. Is that, am I making sense so far, Anika? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're following. But in reality, what colleges do, if you win that merit scholarship, is they use that merit money to meet the need. So instead of saying you're getting 25000 mm-hmm. off of need and we'll take 25000 of merit and that erases the 50 cost of attendance, they use the merit to meet the need. And that's something that oh, people wow. don't know And sometimes they apply for all these scholarships, they win them, only to find out they're not getting more money. The college used the merit to meet the need. Wait, isn't that false advertisement? Like, how is that legal? It's legal, but in my opinion, it's not very ethical. Okay, Because it really confuses people. Like, you Mm -hmm. know, they're like, well, why did I apply for this? If you're just going to use the merit offer I won to meet the need. Right. Hmm. That's something that, People need to be very, very, very careful, you know, cognizant of. And I I mentioned that in the chapter. I talked about that. And so I wanted to make sure that we brought that up. The other thing that we said in this chapter that's I don't think I've said enough of here on the podcast is I've talked about how when it comes to merit scholarships, particularly for, you know, for private schools, if you're in the very top five to 10 percent of the applicant pool, you get the really big ones. And maybe if you're in the top quarter to the third, you get a smaller one. And sometimes they have like four or five levels, right? That's just, you know, I'm just being overly simplistic here. But one thing I haven't said as much as bears emphasizing, actually, I'll just, I'll just read this. I'm reading strictly from the chapter. There are even a sizable number of colleges that automatically give everybody a small tuition discount in order for them to feel special and therefore increase their chances of awarding. But these awards are small for students that aren't standouts in the applicant pool. In other words, there are a lot of colleges that give merit to 80, 90, 100% of the applicant pool. And Mm. they basically just add 10 to 15,000 to their price and then automatically give everybody a 10 to $15,000 scholarship. That's a very, very common model as well. (sighs) What do you think about that, Anika? Well, I think it goes into that unethical behavior to me, but that's just Well, me. that's just marketing. That's... In other words, well, if, yeah, if but, that, mm. so if, if I'd say my price is 65000 for my college, but in reality I give everybody 15000 then they feel great. Johnny gets to feel great. He gets to tell grandma that he won a $15,000 scholarship. 
He, you know, he gets to feel really proud of himself. Mom feels really good. Look at my amazing kid who won the $15,000 scholarship. And Johnny is more likely to enroll in the school. So what do you think the takeaway from that should be for that practice? Well, to pay attention, number one, because I do want, I want you to help me understand at least when you say that they take some of that merit money and apply it to the need, at what point do I see that? Is that in the award letter? And I say, oh, wait, my merit money actually went down and here's more need on that line. Is that literally where it, when that comes out? So that's a great question. It will absolutely be on your aid award. And basically for people not familiar with that term, your aid award is just a breakdown of all of the the costs of the college, as well as the money you're receiving to go to the college. It's a financial mm-hmm. breakdown of both the expenses as well as any money you're receiving to go. So you'll see it on the aid award, but now that you're empowered through your college bound kid with this incredible <laughs> knowledge, <laughs> you can ask anybody on the front end. You can ask an admission officer. If I get this merit scholarship, will you give me that in addition to my need base or will you use the merit and apply it to my need? You can ask them Mm -hmm. that. But I will tell you this. You can just assume that that's what they're going to do because this is the norm. What I'm sharing is the norm, not the exception. Okay. But what I was talking about was if everybody's going to get, if it's one of these schools that gives a merit scholarship to everybody as part of a marketing strategy, One thing that I think is important for everybody to know is it just reinforces something that we've been trying to teach from day one, which is ignore sticker price, focus on net price. So net price is your cost after free money, grants and scholarships. Okay, that's all you really should care about. Net sticker price is the list cost of attendance. Don't get sticker shock and get intimidated by it because it's what you pay, not what the list price is. Remember before me using the example, uh, Anika, of you go into a store, you buy a pair of pants and they're listed at 99, but there's a line through it that says 39. And I said, Mm -hmm. do you really care that it said 99? No. All you care about is that your cost is 39. And that's what I'm trying to train people to do. What are you thinking over there in North Carolina land, Anika Madden? (laughs) I was about to go into the question. (laughs) I thought that was a good break for you. Okay. That is a good break. I just didn't know if you had any more thoughts. It's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right, Mark, this week's question is from Dan in Maryland. And Dan asks, what should I do if my child accidentally submitted an earlier version of the personal statement? I don't see a way to resubmit that essay via the Common App. If he contacts the university to ask to email an updated version, do they look at that as someone who made an honest mistake or someone who's not thorough and detail oriented? All right. Thank you, Dan, from Maryland for the question. Much appreciate it. And there's really two questions here. So I'm going to break it down into two parts. So let's break it down individually. So the first question is basically, can you retract your personal statement? And before I mention this, let me just say, there's so many applications out there. Okay, you know, we've got the UC app. Texas has its own app. There's something called the Black Common app that's out there. We've talked about the coalition before. I mean, there's just so many different types of applications. And and of course, each individual schools have their own individual application as well. This is a specific question about the Common app, which is what we talk about the most on our podcast because 900 colleges and growing. And it is the largest application in the country and is the one that is accepted by the most schools. So this is a something specifically in the Common App. It is a 650-word main essay that goes to all your schools. So I'm saying all that to say what I'm saying applies specifically to the Common App. So what's an application or not just the main application, even a writing supplement? Because remember, in the Common App, you can have individual college-specific essays as well. Once it has been submitted to any institution, you cannot make any changes to that application. In fact, think this is the easiest way for you to think of it. I know it's all done on computer, but it would be no different than if you just, if you mailed it in the mail. If you mailed it in the physical mail in the mailbox, once you've sent it, you've sent it. Okay, and it's not like, you know, just think sometimes because it's computer, we think it's different. 
Once it's sent, it's sent. And by the way, a college is not permitted to make a change on your behalf either. It's not like you could call a college and say, can you make this change for me? You know, I have like these seven typos. Can you like make the change? So the college can't change it and you can't change it. When it's submitted, it's submitted. The Common App is designed to be completed in one time and submitted and done with. So if you need to make a change at all on any submitted application, then you would need to contact the college admission directly and ask them how they would like you to proceed. So that's part one of the question. I'll talk about part two in a second, but what are your thoughts on that, Anika? I mean, it is what it is, right? You just can't. Yeah, is that what you thought the answer was going to be? Actually, I didn't know because mm-hmm. I was hopeful in this case that there was a chance, but I guess not. Sorry, Dan. So that means it was a great question by Dan. It's yeah. one that you didn't know the answer to either. Mm-hmm. So let's dive into part two. So, well, actually, before I comment on part two, I want to say this. So with the Common App, you've sent it off to one school. Let's say you've hit submit to one school, but you haven't completed your application, let's say, for another five or six schools. You can change it on future submissions for future colleges. Okay, you can change your personal statement for the colleges you haven't hit submit to, and it will upload to them. So I don't want people to think, okay, you got eight schools in the Common App you're planning on applying to. You send it off to one. You realize you made mistakes. There's nothing you can do about the other seven. For the other seven that you haven't hit submit to, you can make changes on those and it will be effective for them. Was that what you would have expected, Anika? Or did you think it was like, it's a wrap for all eight? Yeah, well, yeah, I forgot that you don't do them all at one time. So yeah, Correct. I guess that makes sense. But I mean, I guess it's unfortunate if you so happen to send it to your top school first and that's the Correct. one that you sent the wrong version to. So yikes. Correct. So part two of Dan's question really is, is it worth it or does it make such a bad impression that it's not worth the hassle of going through? Because it's going to reverberate back to you in deleterious ways. That's really Mm -hmm. the second aspect of his question. And my advice here is I would strongly advise against reaching out to a college and telling them about the change. Hmm. In the overwhelming majority of instances, The fact that you are doing this will draw so much attention to it that it's not going to be worth it. And it Mm -hmm. just does make a bad impression. It would be like, Anika, you're a hiring manager, you know, and you're collecting a whole bunch of resumes, you know, for a top job. And then now somebody reaches out to you. You're getting a whole bunch of them. Someone reaches out to you. Oh, by the way, I submitted the wrong resume. Like, you know, know, I've got all these changes. That's how now you're seen through the prism of the person that wasn't organized, wasn't responsible, didn't proofread, didn't check. That's my first impression of you. Hmm. That's not a good first impression. And this is going to surprise some people, but the average college is reading your whole personal statement in about 90 seconds, some cases 60 seconds. Now that does not mean it's not important because really good admission officers, I really adroit at reading quickly and ascertaining all they need to in a short period of time. They learn how to speed read. And the really bad essays absolutely can cause you to be denied. And the really amazing ones can, if you're on the fence, can take you into the admit pile. So essays absolutely can make a difference. That's where you emotionally connect and bond with the reader. And that's where they increase their likability of you. And that's where they get to figure out what you're bringing to their campus. So I'm not trying to minimize the importance of it, but unless it's just such an egregious error you made to the point where it's just going to be a deal breaker for you. So you've got nothing to lose. So I may as well reach out. I would just let sleeping dogs lie. What are your thoughts on that, Anika? So, uh, well, if it is something major, like, are you saying it's still not worth reaching out? Like, No. What if, because, okay, let's use an example. Let's just say I yes. left out a whole, like, literally, there was a document on my computer that it had a bunch of, it was like a brainstorming document versus my actual statement. Yeah. And I literally picked the wrong document. So are you saying, okay, it's a totally, let's just say not even gibberish. It's just something related to something else. No, it's just my gas bill. No. Like that. No. So what I'm saying is if it's that egregious, then you would do it. If it's to the point where what I submitted was so bad that I'm probably going straight into the denial pile after that, Mm -hmm. then you have nothing to lose and you may as well do it. Okay. Then, yeah, you are, of course, running the risk of bad first impression. 
gee, I wish they would have proofread. I wish they'd been more responsible. But you also might encounter someone that's, hey, I've made a mistake like this too. You know, I appreciate them being conscientious. Some of it's going to depend on the admission officer and, you know, how serious of an error they see that you made. You know, so a lot of this is highly subjective and it can depend. What if you're speaking to someone who did something like that themselves? They're going to be a lot more gracious to you than somebody who's completely overwhelmed with work, totally stressed out, doesn't know how they're going to get through everything. And now they're having to do double work for you because you didn't do what you're supposed to do, which is proof it, you know, read it multiple times. But to answer your question, no, if it's something that's so bad that you feel like my chances of admission are pretty much tanked if they read that, then you have nothing to lose and you may as well do it. And hopefully you'll encounter somebody who's gracious. Okay. What do you think, Anika? Does that make sense? Do you you have questions, concerns, Mm -hmm. pushback, any of that? No, it's unfortunate, but you know, like you said, do what you can and it's not the end of the world. We know that. <laughs> but yeah. No, not at all. And I think I always like to have a takeaway. And so hopefully the takeaway for people is to double check your work. And it always is good to have somebody to have another, you know, that whole thing. And Nikki, you've started talking about this before, because I know you do a lot of marketing publications about that whole thing about having another set of eyes on it. Oh, three sets, four if you can. So, yeah. yeah. So, so talk about that from your experience. Do you- what do you mean? Just editing in general? Well, just, yeah. Aren't there times when you found that you've looked something over and over and over, a marketing publication, and then another set of eyes saw something right away? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's just the natural, that's the natural part of the process is for me, because it's funny how on some teams, some people get offended when you want to check their work. It's like, no, this is just part of the process. Like, you should always want somebody and two people to look at the work before it goes out to masses of people and important people, especially in something as important as an application like that. So just consider right. it's part so that of the process. Right, so that to me should be the take. The takeaway for people, like go through that process, even if it feels tedious and right. unnecessary. It's one of those things where it's better be safe than sorry. That's right. Every time. Yes. And friends, as Dave mentioned, this will be the last of a three part interview with Idan Shahar, founder of Test Innovators. So, friends, one of the things that Idan talks about here is his passion and his concern for what we call the opportunity gap that exists between the haves and the have-nots when it comes to test and test prep. And he shares what his company is doing to bridge that gap. I think you'll enjoy it. And of course, I put him on the hot seat and he has a really interesting background. So it's interesting learning a a little bit about him that's not related to what he does when it comes to test prep. Because Idan is one of these sort of stereotypical entrepreneurs. He's 24-7, 365, tunnel vision. And that's one of the reasons he's been so successful. So listen and enjoy. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Yeah, and you're saying if you think you're going to have some utopic standard that so- solves all these problems, it's not going to happen. There will always privilege will always find a way to, you know not game the system, but come close to gaming the system, or at least exercise its, <laughs> exercise its advantages. You know, there'll be some consultant out there that will out- learn and will, you know, charge top dollar or whatever to coach people around it, you know? Yeah, and I guess maybe maybe that would, you know, if it was, maybe if the objective was to just bring it a lot closer to what it is to be a student and we had people, you know, help you gain being a better student and being a better person and created more and more tools for that. Maybe that wouldn't be such a bad thing. But anyway, so yeah, and, I'll, you know, and, I'll, and I'll give an example. I'm very critical of US as a word report and its rankings, but I'll, I'll yeah. give them a little credit in one area. So one thing they've done recently is they've put more emphasis on graduation and retention rates. And so that's forced colleges then to put more resources into saying, okay, we're taking a lot of money. We're going to be judged now by whether you get to the finish line and how, or or whether you leave after a year. So what can we do to improve our systems? So there are some things they've actually done that have had positive outcomes on colleges because they improved the metric. It's just still so flawed overall, but you know, there are some positive things they're doing. So, but I think we're getting off on a tangent. I think one thing that you know, people may be thinking, well, Mark, you sound like you're su- really supportive of the test optional movement. Yeah. Why would you have <laughs> a test prep company, a founder of a test prep company, come on here to talk about his company? And one of the things that I still encounter all the time is 
there's still a lot of schools that are not test optional. Right. And the majority. So, the yeah, the majority. majority. Like occasionally it's it's yeah. going in that direction. So like I, you know, I, I had a student I met with last Sunday night and she's not a good tester and she's a great overall kid. And it's at the point now where I can sit down and say, okay, you know, I can literally build your list off all of test optional schools. But right. most of the time when that happens, I have the kid or the family, but I really want to apply to this school, you know? And yeah. so we don't want to limit kids' options. So there is an aspect where if we want to have the outcomes that kids want, we do have to play the game. And the whole test prep part is a little bit of playing the game. I tell people it's a little bit like, you know what? There's certain jobs you're just not going to get if you don't have a college degree. Right. And if you want to get the job, put together a resume because a resume is required for you to even submit the job. So you can tell me all you want. I don't like resumes. I think resumes are biased and it shouldn't be, you know, guess what? Do you want the job? You need to have the right. resume. You need right. to have the college degree. So. And, or go to the interview. You know, I mean, those, they right. are there are lots of things, know, right? Very, very biased. Yeah. So all these things exist. Absolutely. And I think, I think that should be the project for all of us is to both try, as I was saying before, it's to try to optimize, you know, improve the world. And when, in small ways and big ways, if we do, if we can have impact to try to better it and then also live in the world as it is today and try to do the best we possibly can now and here. Yeah. And let's go back to money, Edan, because one of the things that we, I don't think we've said this just as explicitly and directly and forthrightly as, as I think we should. Yeah. One of the things that you do as a company to help bridge the opportunity gap is you provide very affordable tools. That's true. You know, very affordable tools that, I mean, it's the same thing that I try to do in my company. I try to have very affordable options for people so that I'm not only serving one social class. You know, let's talk about, let's just get into it. Why don't we talk about sure. some, you know, some of your pricing and, and what you offer and what people would get for what price point. And I think just that in and of itself will speak to one of the major ways in which you're out here trying to level the playing, you know, the playing field. Yeah, so everything is, you know, as much as a few hundred dollars and, you know, as starting, starting as little as $50. So it's kind of in that range, anywhere from 50 to 350, maybe 400 at sort of the, for specific packages. And yeah, we, you know, it's very, very important to us, as I mentioned before, to make it affordable. We do also have scholarships for those students, for those families that can't afford it. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's really important because, you know, there are a lot of families that can afford something in that price point and spend right. that money on, you know, yeah. certain things <laughs> that they don't have to have, whether it's the latest phone or yeah. on the prom or whatever. And so that in of itself speaks for itself. And then the fact that yeah. even then, and I know from working with you and you know this, there've been times that I've said to yeah. you, Edan, I don't think this family can even pay that. And you've always worked with me, you know, one thing actually, I actually appreciate that you do, Edan, is you make sure people don't, try to exploit you and you yeah. have some verification steps in place. Do you call similar to like the college board does, right? Like, yes. you know, are you getting free and reduced lunch? Are you living in section eight housing? Those kind of things. And right. I actually think that's important because people need to learn to not sort of get over on people and people do need to sort of, you know, people should pay their fair share. It shouldn't be just <laughs> as simple as, as I had somebody say to me once, tell me it was like a program where you had to qualify, had a lot of benefits, but you had to be low income. And yeah. I never forget this person is, Tell me what the income is because I can get poor real fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there's also there's also just I think the truism of if you pay a little bit, you will just take it more seriously, which we've always seen. And it's and it's an interesting if you get something for free, you just think it's valueless. So there's That's also so the psychology. Important. Yeah. That's so important. You know, I skin in the game. I do that yeah. with even with you know, my lower income families that I, I work with, like you know, yeah. with Kip, when we used to do, we used to do these big college trips to go around the country and not have anybody pay anything. And then we've done all this planning and the people no show us, you know, right. or right. they go and they're not engaged. And so now right. we have a fee and you're going to be right. invested. And right. we work right. with people and, you know, and we be reasonable, but I'm yeah. a huge believer in skin in the game. Yeah. Yeah. We actually ran a really awesome, well, so we did this incredible thing. We work with uh, an amazing organization that you actually connected us to called The Better Chance. They do some amazing work. And one of the things that we did this year, maybe started last year, was we run a specialized summer program for them. But we actually have them give money. And then if the student completes the program, they get a partial refund. That's smart. So there's like additional measures and tools to ensure that you can create that accountability and engagement, which we found to, of course, be absolutely critical. 
You know, I can't remember what college it was, but one of the colleges I met with in this fall, I meet with like 160 to 180 a year. So wow. I'm drawing a blank. But yeah. um, they had this concept, and I actually thought it was smart. So, you know, instead, what they do is they they charge ten dollars per game for their football games. Yeah. But anyone who attends all, you know, all your football games is not that many. It's like seven, right? Anyone yeah. who attends all seven gets their money back. It's kind of wow. like, kind of the same concept, cool. right? Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I think it's really innovative. And I think that, you know, we started getting into sort of the uh into the different hacks <laughs> that companies and and folks are able to do in order to optimize for a specific objective. So yeah, for us. Of course, like anything else in life, the more you put in, the more you get out. So in our objectives to try to help students, we've tried these different tool sets to see what will work. And it's been very effective. So it is really interesting. All right, friends, we're getting ready to wind down, but we can't leave Edon without our lightning round. Our regular listeners know that we always put our guests on the hot seat, get to know them a little bit more than just the entrepreneur, test prep expert. So let's start with this question, Edan. If you weren't founding a test prep company, what would you be doing? I think that I recently have been taking uh, Coursera classes, and I got really interested in two areas, either some microbiology. I'm really fascinated by what's happening today in genomics, and I think that's absolutely incredible. I think it's sort of the next frontiers are going on there. And then the other is law. I had the being an entrepreneur, I interact with a lot of lawyers. I always have such a great time talking to them until I get the bill at the end. And I'm like, why did I, why, why was I talking to you for so long? So, you know, if I could talk to them and not be on the clock um, and, and, you know, be discussing things like that, I think I'd enjoy it a lot. That's pretty cool. So yeah. where, where's your favorite place to vacation? You don't vacation that much, but maybe I no, should say, no. where, where's your favorite place in the world you've been? Maybe I should put it that way. No, so, so that's a, first of all, I guess maybe I'm a risk taker or entrepreneur. So I like different and new and exciting. So, you know, whether it's uh, being in Sinai um, in Egypt, though, right now, I'm not sure if that's such a, such a safe place to be, or South America and Ecuador, spending some time in the Amazon jungle or spending time in, in uh, certain parts of China and Hong Kong, especially now. All of that seems exciting to me, though I actually just recently had a baby. So maybe my more exciting days need to be a little bit more mellow. But certainly, I have vacation in exciting places. When it comes to relaxing, what do you do when you're not doing work and you just want to chill and unwind? How do you chill? I don't know if I do too much of that. I, <laughs> I know you don't. That's why I knew that was going to be the hardest question for you. Oh, this is tough. Maybe I'll ask it differently. When you watch TV, what's your favorite TV show? You don't do yes, a lot of that either, I know. But maybe that helps. I guess I, I do a lot of reading. I, you know, and I'm reading a lot of books. Like I said, Coursera classes on learning about subjects that are very much outside of my expertise is very interesting to me. I've also been really enjoying sports. I do like basketball. I like the, you know, we're recording this later today. There's the game. Um, oh, yeah, I'm the, watching that game. You talking about, we're talking about LeBron versus Milwaukee? That's right, yeah. So I'm very excited. Yes. Well, I, I have to DVR because I have a client meeting. And they're actually coming <laughs> to my house. I don't oh, want like okay. 1% of people come to my house, but this family's coming. I have a, my whole basement is set up like, I put like 50,000 is set my whole basement up as a, <laughs> a place so I can meet people. I've got the whiteboard and everything there. So this one, I can't like, you know, anyway, but it's right, well, DBRing it and watching okay. that game. I'm a big basketball yeah. guy. <laughs> yeah. So, and then also I'm here in Seattle. So of course we've got, we've got the Seahawks, which are exciting. And usually we are exceptionally good at having exceptionally bad teams. So the run that they've had over the last few years with our quarterback has been quite awesome. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. Our recommended resource for episode 113 is the website laurelsprings.com. Now, the Laurel Springs School is a K-12 through distance learning school that is located in Ojai, California, and it is accredited by the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. This accreditation ensures that Laurel Springs will be respected by everybody who attends the school. It ensures that students will receive credits, courses, and grade-level placements while their transcripts receive recognition from colleges and universities worldwide. Laurel Springs Schools offers personalized resources, customizable curriculum, individual teacher services, college advising, 
and other services. Laurel Springs High School received the United Nations Global 500 Roll of Honor Award. Laurel Springs is not a new school. It is in its 30th year now. And a lot of actors and athletes and musicians are enrolled in Laurel Springs. And it is also popular with families who are living abroad, and it is often used by many homeschooled students who are looking for an accredited program. In essence, Laurel Springs is an accredited online private school with a global outreach. What students and parents like about Laurel Springs is that it offers a flexible schedule, which allows students to progress through material at a pace that is in sync with their individual skills and knowledge. Students use this flexibility to adapt their schedules to accommodate their outside interests. Another strength of Royal Springs is the fact that they offer rolling enrollment, which allows students to begin work at any time of the year. Now, friends, in this age of corona that we all are living in, I wanted to share laurelsprings.com with you because as I talk with college office admission officers, they respect their curriculum and the work Laurel Springs is doing. Hey, Don, tell our listeners, we've talked about it before, but I've just done a, I do this little recommended resources, like a 90 second blurb in every podcast. I've yeah. talked about Coursera, but tell our listeners a little bit more about Coursera because still a lot of people don't know about it. And of course there's, you know, there's edX and there's some others as well. Yeah. But talk about MOOCs and, you know, what's available out there for people. Yeah. So again, it's interesting for me. I don't, uh, you know, maybe not relevant for everyone, but they are, the world's information is becoming accessible on the internet. And there are a lot of colleges and professors that are putting on their courses on these different free platforms. You can pay 50 bucks to get some sort of silly certification. I don't pay that. Maybe I should. Uh, but nonetheless, <laughs> you nonetheless, want to be you a microbiologist or it's hurting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's just, you can do the number of things that you can learn now, which is I think another whole area, which is probably maybe we can save for the next podcast, but where is education going when all of this information is available and what is the role of institutions is really, really interesting. I think it, I think it changes from just knowledge acquisition to sort of socialization, collaboration, gaining skill sets, you know, that EQ thing that we were talking about, really that does become much more of the focal point when you can just jump online and you can literally see that same professor give that same course that you are sitting in front of and paying a lot of money for. So where is the role of all that is really, really interesting. That's great. That's great. So when you want to go to a restaurant, what's your favorite food? Sushi. I've been enjoying sushi a lot recently. There's good sushi in Seattle too. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty amazing here. Yeah. You're in a good place for sushi. That fresh stuff right there. You're bringing back some memories and making me want some lunch. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Great. So what the best book or two you've read in your life? Okay. Uh, I've got many books, but I will, let's see if I can keep it down. So I would say sort of among the top three, uh, I would say Man's Search for Meaning uh, by Viktor Frankl. Um, it really talks about, yeah, I mean, I think it's a central, you know, the stories we tell ourselves, the life that we lead, you know, what we really have control over is how we react to things. And again, mm-hmm. I think it has a lot of a lot of relevance to to the business that I'm in and probably to any life. So that's one. The second is uh, A Long Walk to Freedom, Nelson Mandela, just an absolutely incredible story. And I think the most important and interesting part of that story is the transition that Mandela had to have after being in jail. I mean, I, it's like I'm repeating what other people have said, but it's it's still fascinating and worth reading. The transition that he had to make after being in jail, knowing when the opportunity was there to strike a peace deal and sort of, a, you know, the peace and, and reconciliation process was just absolutely critical. Another book that I highly recommend is um, The Happiness Hypothesis, mm. which is by... Um, Jonathan Haidt is the author's name, and he's a psychologist. And it just talks about how the mind works. And it's just, it's a, I think it's one of those, like, should be a required reading for, mm. for adults because it, I learned a lot about myself in the process. So those are just three that come to mind. But, I, you know, maybe I should make a list because I have, like, about 150 that I recommend. Yeah, you should. Edon's list. Book of the month. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I know, I know when I ask somebody like you, that question is going to be tough. And I had one person they got up to their fifth and i cut them off i'm like okay five that's it but you know our listeners literally will buy these books and they'll send in emails and they'll say you know i got such a great idea from your guests and i'm loving this book so i I always like to ask that question so two more two more for you i'll ask them at the same time 
Sure. So your best advice for parents and your best advice for students. I know I went deep on you. Sure. No, that's, that's right. Yeah. I think my best advice for students is this is all a journey and to think of it as, you know, I guess maybe one thing would be interesting is if you think about your, if you're a student applying for college, it might feel like the end all be all which college you get into and what you do, but think about it like how it was for you between sixth and 10th grade. Like it was very, very important for you, but you would have been fine if you had gone in a different path. And ultimately the life that you create for yourself, of course, is just so much beyond anything that happens in college. And like I said, you should consider your education to be an ongoing endeavor that you have until the day you die. And so, you know, set yourself up in a place where you can, learn how to learn in the most ideal way. And that's probably not going to necessarily, you know, there's going to be a few students where that is in the most competitive, no matter what Mm -hmm. opportunity. But for the vast majority, you need to, you ought to find a place that really will spark curiosity for you. And that's really what I'd recommend. And I guess for parents, I would recommend that they listen to the previous one and maybe chill out a little bit. (laughs) <laughs> so what, apply that as well to them? So. Yeah, exactly. I think that uh, maybe just, hey, if the quality of that you have as a parent is not determined by the admission letter that your child gets, but by the type of adult that they become over the years thereafter. And that's, you know, and if you have put in the hard work of creating a, a good person, you know, I, I have a... Uh, my grandma who has passed, she's a, she's a Holocaust survivor. And she would always say that, you know, it doesn't matter how much success or anything else you get in life. The most important thing is to be a good person, which maybe is again, a little cliche, but she survived on the kindness of strangers in her life. And so I think that it's, you know, to build that type of morality into your kids is far more important and, you know, just chill out a little bit. I'm actually really glad that you said that, you know, because you know, recently we, you know, we had Rick Clark on here, Georgia Tech's admission director, and he's really into soccer a lot and he coaches and all that. And he's got kids and they play. And so he's talking about sitting out in the stands and a kid gets a goal and all the parents are sitting together and they turn around and almost like congratulate the parent of the kid. <laughs> as if like the parent, you know, did something good. And then he, and he used that analogy, like that's how parents oftentimes see the college admission process. As it's yeah. a, a reflection on whether or not they're a good parent and they did a good job. And actually, a lot of times society reinforces that, especially right. in upwardly mobile communities. Right. And I think it's something that's so subtle, but it's so insidious. And I think right. actually just consciously processing, am I doing that? And if I am, let me mentally repudiate those thoughts and just sort of right. reject that whole value system. I think it's something that a lot of people would reject if they actually think right. about it. But if you don't right. think about it, it like creep, can creep into your thinking. And then you're, it's almost like, this is just a bad example that popped into my mind. It's like getting germs, like it's subtle and you pick up germs and now it spreads throughout your body. You don't even really yeah. know what's happening, you know? Yeah, it's a meme sort of in the Richard Dawkins kind of, you know, it's this idea that exists sort of beyond people's decision to control. And I think, again, that's why I, the books that I actually mentioned, all of them have to do with, people sort of self-authoring and deciding how they're going to tell the story of their life and that being so critical in everything. So again, you know, if that, if you are actively choosing and you, that is important for you to create this narrative for your child, then I guess so be it. But just make sure that this is the story you want to tell your kids that, you know, their self-worth and your worth as a parent is really that tightly coupled to an admissions decision is, is silly. And it's also not true. That's the other part of it is, if you ultimately measure, you know, the value of life sort of in the summation of what you do over the course of your life, the specific school that you go to has less of an effect than we like to believe, or than maybe many people in, implicitly believe. Hey, Don, this has been fantastic. You shared earlier before we came on that you you had a little special offer you wanted to extend to some of our listeners. Are you still up for that or did you chicken out? No, no, that's fine. Yeah, we can certainly do that. So um, I think it'll be on your website, but we'll offer a coupon code that will offer all the materials that we have at a reduced rate for anyone that's interested. And so I guess anywhere that folks uh, listen to this, can you share the website that they'll go to to get that information? Yeah, absolutely. So I can do a lot of things. I can certainly put you know the link in the show notes and then we can okay. put something up on the website as well. And I can just say you're doing fantastic work. You, you care about 
kids. And the one thing that I love uh, about what you do, Don, is that you're always trying to get better. You never are comfortable settling where you are. You're always studying a student of anything out there that you can possibly do. What tool, what tactic, you know, whether it's your software engineers or whatever it is, can you use to implement to deliver even better performance? And so, you know, I know your company is growing and it's growing really, really, really fast. And it doesn't surprise me at all because I think you understand something at a basic level, which is, you know, we have to deliver results. And if we deliver results, you know, we're going to experience a lot of organic growth. And and I'm happy to support you because I, I really respect what you do and I respect the values that you bring to what you do. So yeah, we'll be happy to get that up on the website and introduce you to our community. So thanks a bunch for coming on today, Don. Yeah, thank you, Mark. And you've been instrumental in my growth as well. You opened my eyes to some of the organizations that already exist that are doing great work. So as I mentioned, there's a better chance and there's others as well. And so that's been incredible for me. So again, I thank you for helping me in my own life journey about, you know, on my pursuit to to better the world and to learn more. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. I appreciate our friendship. Listen, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You too. All right, take care, my friend. Mark, can I just make a breaking news interruption? Yeah, of course. Just came over my feed. NBA suspends season due to coronavirus. Suspends the season? Dude, I'm looking at it. I'm like, you you got to be kidding me. NBA suspends. I guess you listeners are are our listeners are just realizing maybe they even are huge basketball people who so are always talking about LeBron and Giannis. And of course, you know, you mentioned the last couple of podcasts ago how we would play ball, out, out, all five, you, Andrew, Michael, Norm, five of us would make a five something. We play yeah. on Banbury courts. Yeah. The season is suspended. Yeah. So, so folks, I got to tell you that if you believe you, in the. You sure it doesn't say they're not going to play in front of audiences? Uh, okay, look, this is the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and the second one just came riding into the room. I'll read it for you. Oh Quote goodness. The NBA has suspended its season until further notice after a Utah Jazz player tested positive Wednesday for the coronavirus. Oh the NBA is suspending gameplay following the conclusion of tonight's schedule of games until further notice. The NBA will use this hiatus to determine next steps for moving forward in regards to the coronavirus pandemic. Wow. wow. This is crazy. David, the rate through. at which things are going, I'm really glad wow. that you emphasize that we're recording this, you know, 15 days before. Because who knows what things are going to be in the country when everybody hears this on the 26th. Oh, my goodness. I mean, my, I'm my, all, my, you know, I have mixed we're, feelings, we're, Dave. Yeah. I have mixed feelings, like, I think this is so serious that you need to take aggressive precautions. Yeah. But I am a little worried that like the freak out is going to lead people to even freak out more. But I don't know. You're the doctor. Well, you know, I've already talked about my wife that it's inevitable that they're going to have travel restrictions. It's inevitable that one of the ER docs is going to test positive. I mean, if they just think about it, if, if one I'm just nurse, hoping it's not you, Dave. Well, <laughs> so this is funny. So, Frida says, well, if they test positive, I think it's better that you stay in Connecticut and keep on working and don't in fact test <laughs> So I just want to listen. My wife loves me, but it's she's very like, human kicked reaction. me to the curb. <laughs> so, so in other words, it's like, I love you, sweetie, but don't come home and keep on working. <laughs> I think a lot of spouses love their spouse, but they don't want them giving them Corona, okay? Absolutely. I think she has a lot of company on that one. Absolutely. You can do a little 12-state travel, bounce on over to Virginia, bounce on over to, to North Carolina and everywhere else you go. Just keep staying on the road, be a traveling doc. No stops in Chicago. I'm just going to have to fifth bump my daughter. No more hugs. <laughs> no. Yeah, I'm the biggest exactly. vaccination. But, but on a serious note, it is an, a, you know, you had asked me before, it is an inevitability that the medical staff will get infected. It is an inevitability that quarantines will be in place. And so the big question is, where will you be and how will you react? And, you know, when they always tell you that to have six months in emergency funds socked away just in case you can't get a paycheck, this is one of those times, folks. So, Well, I'm starting to take this social isolation stuff seriously. Like, I'm yeah. serious. Like, I already work from home, but I had planned a whole bunch of 
visits, both college and school. And I may just uh, bump those puppies back a little bit until, you know, things clear. Yeah. Next week in the news, Mark and I actually want to hold off on announcing what we will specifically talk about because with the events of Corona moving so fast, we want to leave the option of doing an audible. Yeah, friends, Dave and I have this article on legacy admissions we are very excited to talk about since 112, and we're ready to go, we're prepped. But if it's more pressing things going on in society, we'll get to that article. Our premise is we'll get to that article eventually. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. After we start, stop mourning the loss of the NBA season. Mark oh. and Anika will be talking about how the internet can help you find the right merit scholarships for you to apply to. Mark and Anika will be answering a question from Keisha from Ohio. Keisha wants to know, should my child take the ACT or the SAT? Mark will be in part one of his interview with Vincent Garcia. And Mark and Vince will be discussing how to understand the 23 universities in the California State University system. And finally, Mark will be going to Ohio for the third time for our college spotlight. And he and I will be discussing the University of Cincinnati. Okay, friends, it's time for one of the heavyweights, time for one of the big boys on the block, Brown University. And thanks to you, you know, I've shared before, if you have call spotlights you want me to do, please send in your requests. And one of you sent in and requested Brown University, a uh, school I'm very familiar with. And so because of that request, we bumped it up the list. Brown is the seventh oldest college in the country, founded in 1764. So we are talking about more than 250 years old. The college was founded as Rhode Island College initially, and it was founded right at First Baptist Church, right in Warren, Rhode Island. And they had their first commencement in Warren, Rhode Island in 1769, but then their original church building burned to the ground by British and Hessian soldiers later in 1778. However, the college had already been in the process of moving locations before this, and they moved to their present location in College Hill, right in the east side of Providence. Now, the Brown family is an interesting family. There's several of them. There's Nicholas, John, Joseph, and Moses. They are very instrumental in the move to Providence, both in terms of all the organization they provided, the construction of the new buildings, the funding, and the connection was so strong. Joseph Brown was a professor of physics at the university. John Brown was a treasurer for multiple years. And then after John Brown's death, the university was renamed Brown University. Technically, it was renamed in honor of their nephew, Nicholas Brown, who had been a member of the class of 1786. But there's some dispute, was it all about Nicholas or was it just all the Browns? Because the whole Brown family had just been so significant in the first few decades of Brown University. So they changed the name. Now, Rhode Island is a state that is known for its tolerance. And this goes all the way back to its founding by Roger Williams. And Brown fits in the zeitgeist of the time. This is not a conservative institution. Rather, this would be, as some would say, a hotbed of liberalism. And there's also a lot of student activism around a lot of liberal social concerns. So some of the hot issues on campus at Brown right now are the environment, the Me Too movement, income inequality, immigrant rights and LGBTQ rights. The thing that Brown is best known for is its open curriculum. And so what Brown does is they consider students to be the architect of their own education. So they have no core curriculum, they have no distribution requirements. Uh, and let me explain this in case this is a little confusing. There are actually only about a half a dozen schools in the country that have a true open curriculum. I'm talking about schools like Smith, Amherst, Hamilton, Hampshire, Grinnell, and Vassar. And there's some others like Rochester, Wesleyan, that have sort of a quasi-open curriculum. But there's basically three main curriculum models. With an open curriculum, other than your major, because you have requirements for your major, but outside of your major, you can pretty much take anything you want. So that's open curriculum. Then in the middle, we have what most schools have, which are distribution requirements. And with that, you are required, maybe you have to take three English courses, three humanities courses, maybe two social science courses, maybe two natural science courses, maybe two math, two foreign language, maybe one art class, but you get a lot of choices within the curriculum 
offerings to pick which courses you want. That would be what's known as distribution requirements, which is what most colleges have. And then all the way on the other spectrum, you have a core curriculum, which would be like a Columbia or like a Hillsdale, which we focused on, University of Chicago. We have very explicit courses, which you have to take usually over the first two years. So those are kind of the three main models you see when it comes to curriculum. The only area you really need to take something besides your major courses at Brown is writing. They do have these two writing courses you have to take, but even there, students can opt out of them if they're able to show that one of their other courses emphasized developing writing in a significant way, they can get substituted for those two requirements. And literally, there are no requirements. So students who either despise the subject like math or science or foreign language or something, they can really be drawn to Brown because they don't have to take courses they hate. And the other positive aspect is, you know at Brown, you're going to be surrounded by people in the class that are in that class because they absolutely love that class. They have over 2,000 courses to pick from. And so when you're in a class, my daughter Joy, her favorite class so far she's ever taken is called Race, Class, and Gender, Sociology class, and is elective, and you're in there with people who are passionate about studying race, class, and gender. And so that just adds to the intellectual atmosphere of the course. Brown is a school that almost everybody, almost every course is taught by two professors. They have some TAs, but they're only 2% teaching assistants. All faculty teach undergrads. It is a fairly undergraduate-oriented school. Another distinction about Brown is that they allow you to take a course either for letter grade or pass-fail. So you can choose to take a course traditionally A, B, C, or you can do pass-fail. And the nice thing about it is they allow a student to make this decision up to one month into the course. So let's say you think you're taking it for, you know, ABC grade, by the way, 70 is a passing grade at Brown, and then you're not doing so great in the class or it's adding undue stress, you know, three and a half weeks in, you can say, you know what, I'm going to flip this over to pass fail. And with that, you either just get an S for satisfactory or NC for no credit in terms of how it impacts your transcript. Brown is definitely a collaborative environment where students regard talking about grades, and comparing one another to each other, that is very shunned upon within the Brown community. And the next thing I want to share, which is another incredible feature about Brown, and then I'll just stop for a sec, Dave, and get some comments from you before I finish up, that is a real hallmark of Brown, is their incredible advising. Because a lot of times parents and even students will push back and say, okay, if I'm just going to have a total open curriculum, my kid's going to get lost in that environment. Like, How are they going to end up at the right place? That's too much freedom. In other words, is one of the biggest criticisms they get. And the way Brown addresses that, one is by only admitting highly accomplished, super motivated kids with incredible intellectual curiosity that love learning. That's part of it. And a lot of personal maturity and a track record of a lot of academic discipline, motivation, and high-level success. But the other thing they do is they have this incredible advising system. So you get a bunch of advisors at Brown. You get a faculty advisor. This is someone who will meet with you before you even start at Brown, help you with register, the whole process of registering for classes. They'll meet with you several times throughout your freshman year. They'll help you with your course selection, help you with your extracurriculars, help you know whether to take a class pass-fail or for grades, that kind of thing. You're also going to get a peer advisor. Uh, this is going to be a student. And they're going to be able to come at you more from a student perspective of what the courses are like, balancing your extracurriculars, letting you know Providence, the restaurants, theater, clubs, the social scene, helping you adjust to dorm life. So you get a faculty advisor and a peer advisor, and then you get a concentration advisor. Dave, I'm going to test your memory because I know you've heard every podcast. Yes. One of my admission vernaculars was the word concentration probably like four months ago. Do you remember what that one was? Concentration. Well, the concentration, wasn't that not quite your major, but it was what you were focusing on? No, it's your major. Exactly the same. It's a major. No difference. Okay. Okay. It's a Brown's major. Okay. term for major. They don't call them okay. majors. They call them concentrations. So you get a concentration That's right. That's advisor. Right. Okay. Remember? Remember? I mean, you got it right. You got it right. I'm just That's playing right. hardball with you. That's right. Yep. So the end of your sophomore year, you also get a concentration advisor that helps you with all aspects of what you're going to need to take and what the major's like and everywhere where that leads. And 
If that wasn't enough, they have multiple other advisors that you may get. Everybody's getting a concentration advisor, a peer advisor, a faculty advisor. There are several other advisors. For example, if you study abroad, like 30% of the students do, you have your study abroad advisor. If you decide you are going to be pre-med, pre-law, or pre-business, and Brown is particularly strong programs, particularly in pre-med and pre-law, uh, they have another specialized advisor for your major. So you would get a pre-med advisor or a pre-law or a pre-med advisor or pre-business advisor. So, uh, and there's even other advisors as well. <laughs> so they have advisors for everything at Brown. Anyone who does research at Brown gets a special research advisor. So there's six different advisors that they have. Dave, I'm going to stop for a second and see what comments, thoughts you have. I know you didn't go to Brown, but you went to Princeton. You went to Harvard. Your daughter's at Yale. You got almost half. I should have mentioned Brown's <laughs> in the Ivy League. So Brown, I should have mentioned that. So you, you well, do have Ivy League pedigree over here. Any thoughts? Well, Brown's a great school, uh, and I know Brown very well. When I was graduating from high school way back in the 1980s, Brown had the distinction of being the most popular Ivy, and I think it held it for about 10 years. Is it still the most popular Ivy, Mark, by application? It may not be, but it was when I was uh, coming out of high school. Yeah, I, I mean, it depends how you define it, right? I mean, yeah. you still technically have more applications and slightly lower acceptance rates at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, but Brown has been the hot school. And Brown is the school that a lot of times people will pick over Harvard, Yale, and Princeton because yeah. of these distinctive things that I've been sharing with so far. And the th and it is these things. It is the open curriculum. It is the pass-fail option. It is, you know, the flexibility and the human... You know, Brown has been called the humanitarian Ivy, you know, That's before. Great. It That's is great. less pre-professional than other Ivies. Yeah. And it is where people are highly concerned about causes in life. And okay. so it does attract a kind of person, like let's say your passion is animal rights. You can go to Brown and take all these classes with their 2000 students, with other people that have those passions, be involved in those kinds of clubs. It attracts students like that more so than a place like Penn, which has a lot more of a focus on not everybody, but I can get in Wharton and I can be a 29-year-old billionaire. That's right. But I will say, and this was true when I was coming out of high school and very true now, Brown has one of the most highly coveted combined MD, uh, BA programs. I think that and, uh, and Northwestern are probably the hardest and most prestigious to get into. And I know I was interested as a high school student. And I think that's uh, the idea of getting into Brown being guaranteed of getting into their medical school and still being able to take advantage of their very liberal concentration program as a pre-med is such a win-win situation that I know it's still one of the most popular combined programs out there. Is that still true, Mark? That's absolutely true. It's called yeah. Pluby. It's a BSMD program. Yeah. You know that you don't have to, if you're admitted into Brown, you automatically, with some conditions, you still need to do well there, but they'll waive the MCAT. You won't have to take the MCAT and you can be with the concentration of future doctors. And you're right, it's up there. There's some other schools in the conversation with Northwestern and, and Brown. Um, Rice would be in the conversation, Wash U and some others, but definitely one of the most competitive BSMD programs, which at some point I'll be talking more about for those who are interested uh, yeah. to our listeners. So a few more things about Brown. They do not admit by major or by school. Uh, it's a liberal arts and science curriculum. So they just admit into the school in general, as opposed to be admitting people based on major or into a college within the school. And so that's, you know, just something that you should be aware of. They're very open to students being undecided as a major. In fact, one out of five other students come in undecided. They're fine with that. Believe it or not, they're not a sports powerhouse at all, but they do have one of the largest groups of sports. They have 38 varsity teams and almost a 1,000 athletes of the 6,000 undergrads. So while they're not known as a sports powerhouse, they do have a lot of your more obscure sports as well as every regular sport that you would, I shouldn't say regular, every most common sport that you would think a school would have like your you know, your baseballs and your basketballs and your tennis and your volleyballs and 
softballs and those kind of things. But they also have a lot of your, you know, your other more exotic sports as well. So they have 38 varsity sports. They also have intramurals, athletics, and they have club sports. Um, of course, the Ivy League is their athletic conference. Uh, freshmen, sophomores, and juniors do have to live on campus. It is a requirement, about 80%. And similar last week when we did our focus on Christopher Newport, I was so impressed with how they went from being a total commuter school to very few schools now require freshmen, sophomores, and juniors to all live on campus. You know when a school does that, it's going to give it a real residential feel. About 80% of the seniors will live off campus. Brown is in Providence, a city of about 180,000 people. So it was a very safe city. Great college uh, the town. Whole, yeah, great college town. The whole restaurant district is like five yeah. minutes away. The school itself is right in the historic district, right around the campus. And you know that you're only like an hour away, an hour from Boston in the north, three hours away from New York City. And then, you know, basically about an hour away from the Newport beaches. Another thing that Brown is known for is their career lab. And that's their term for their career center. And they work very hard to find you internships. Uh, while they do not have a formal co-op program, they do have another service program and a networking program called Brown Connect. And they also have one of these things, which I love, which more and more schools are doing. If you do not find a paid internship, if it's either a no pay or a low pay internship, you can apply and receive up to $5,000 from Brown to make your low pay or no pay internship a paid one. That's just really important because you have a lot of students that have to, they know they need internships in order to get jobs. They're like, but I can't do an unpaid internship because I need to make money. And so a lot of schools, and I think this is a real positive trend, are taking your no pay and your low pay internship and paying you so that you can get the money you need to pay your bills, but then also you can get the experience you need to land a job. One thing people should know is every school in the Ivy League only gives away need-based aid. So you will not get merit-based aid from Brown. And so if you're a family that's making over $300,000 and you don't have any other kids in college, you can expect to pay the full $80,000 no matter if your kid is the most brilliant genius in the world. It just is what it is. They, The Ivy League, as an institution, as a group of schools, only give away need-based aid. Now, when it comes to the admission process, they're going to put a tremendous focus on the transcript, like all highly selective schools do. They do put a pretty big focus on your extra currics. Teacher recommendations are really big at Brown. They like to see that students contribute in class, that they elevate the classroom discourse, and they look for that in the recommendations. And this is based on my conversations over the years with you know key leaders at Brown in terms of what they're looking for, as well as like 14 kids that have got into Brown. One thing they're doing this year, which is really cool, in the past, of course, it was an alumni interview that would interview you or in the area, and Brown is a big interview school. They've always been a school that's put a big emphasis on interviews. They're now allowing you to upload a two-minute video, and you have a choice now. Do you want to have a traditional interview, or would you like to upload a two-minute video of yourself? So that's one thing. The other thing I'll tell you about Brown's admission process is that the college-specific essays are extremely important. You need to nail that. If forever they've had their Y Brown and they have others, you need to nail down those essays. Um, this is a school that's really selective. Most of the kids are going to be coming in with test scores, SAT 750 or higher in evidence-based reading and math, ACT scores 32 to 35 range. Of course, they have some students outside of that, but that's where most students are going to land. They also have a reputation of being more of the laid-back Ivy. Were you aware of that, Dave? They're seen as more of the laid-back Ivy? Yes, they did. Ever since John F. Kennedy Jr. went to that campus, I know I'm totally dating myself. <laughs> <laughs> They've had the cool factor going. But yes, they, I, I am aware of that. But one thing that's important, and I think this is where people get it twisted, the laid-back Ivy refers more to the social atmosphere. Brown is incredibly rigorous, especially in the sciences. The sciences are very strong and they are very challenging and they attract very smart kids. So if you're yeah. going back thinking everything's going to be chill, everything's pass fail, you know, lay back Ivy, you may be in for a very rude awakening. Anytime you put yourself in a school where most of the kids coming in are in the top 2% of their class and they're wicked smart and highly motivated and you're in, I mean, you can speak to this, Dave. What's the acceptance rate right now for med school across the country? Oh my goodness. The acceptance rate from all medical schools is 3%. 
<laughs> exactly. So when you're looking so, at a three percent acceptance rate for med school, Brown's acceptance rate, by the way, is ninety two. So ninety two percent of kids coming out of Brown are getting in med school. So they are right. it's it's just serious academics. They have a very strong peer tutoring program, but they also have a very strong professional staff tutoring. So they have both the paid staffers and a really strong peer tutoring. Uh, most students are going to take four classes at Brown. Occasionally, someone will take five. Uh, normally, if they're taking five, then they're going to be doing one of them pass fail. And some of the pre med students, it's not uncommon at all for them to take three courses, particularly if they're taking some of those really hard classes like organic and inorganic chem, general chem, and some of those, you know, they know they need to get that GPA to be one of the 3% to get in med school. So some of the, right. some of the pre med majors will take three. Uh, particularly if they have some hard classes like that. Brown is a place where I mentioned they don't have majors and minors, but they do allow double concentrations. And actually about one out of every four students will do a double concentration, which once again, just basically is their word for a double major. All freshman students are housed with doubles and freshman students, you know, live in a traditional kind of dorm, you know, 50 students on the floor, traditional bathrooms. However, they have all been completely gutted and renovated, and they're all really, really nice. And then when you get into upper-class students, you tend to get more options when it comes to things like suite-style living and apartment-style living. One other thing I'll say is Brown is known for its unit wars, unit wars. And I know Princeton had something similar like this, Dave, but this is like where all the students in their freshman dorm, they compete against other freshman dorms with a bunch of games and contests, and for trophies and prizes, and you're kind of identify with your unit. I remember, Dave, you're taking me back, but didn't you stay in Maddie Hall at Princeton? Oh, man, you have a great memory. <laughs> I sure do. Well, here's how I remember Maddie Hall, <laughs> Matt, Dave. This, Maddie Hall, this is, boy. <laughs> I, brought you, I brought you back memory lane there, didn't Absolutely. I? Absolutely, Maddie Hall, yes. <laughs> so here's one thing. I don't even know if you remember this. This yeah. is like... We're, you know, Dave and I, we kind of, we're like, <laughs> oh, oh, Dave had a birthday. So Dave's not 57. He's passed me up. But we go back a little bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I remember for a while, I don't even know if you remember this, Dave, but, you know, we would be hanging out with people and they would say, where do you go to college? And you would say, Princeton. And they would be like, Princeton, Princeton. They want to like touch you like you're a genius, want you to solve some super hard math problem. <laughs> so you got tired of that. So you started telling people where you go to college. I go to Maddie Hall I, <laughs> to get people off your back. I don't even know if you remember that. Like, yes, yes, like, bring around, it back. Remember that? <laughs> I do. I was like around age 20. So, and I remember your Maddie Hall shirt that you had. So, yeah, so you stuck, well, went back about three and a half decades on that one. Wow, you're good, man. You're good. That was definitely in the uh, in the storage bin of my memory book, Mags. <laughs> Yeah, so Brown has their unit wars, which is pretty cool. And then one tradition they have, which I really like, is one week before graduation as a senior, you reunite again with your unit, just like you did as a freshman. You have a whole another round of unit wars. So you play a whole bunch of games. Of course, now you probably put on the freshman 20. You know what I mean? You're fatter or whatever. You're at a different stage of life. and But you reunite with your unit and, and have a whole series of games, which is pretty cool. Community service is extremely popular at Brown. They have an award-winning sweater center, which helps students find the exact volunteer opportunity that matches their interests. Um, I do want to give a shout out to both Matt Price and Logan, two of uh, Powell, two outstanding admission officers at Brown, who I've spent some you know decent amount of time with in the last six months talking with them about Brown. One other thing to know that AP courses, IB, dual enrollment courses are not going to give you credit at Brown. They will allow you to opt out of some other things that you might take, but you will not come in with like half a year of credit like they will at some schools. And I was going to talk about their BSMD program in Plumy, but Dave, you already talked about that, so I don't need to mention that. Yes, great program. Oh, I'll, I'll say one more thing. The mission of Brown University is to serve the, Dave, see if anything pops here. The mission of Brown University is to serve the community, the nation, and the world by discovering communicating and preserving knowledge and understanding in a spirit of free inquiry and by educating and preparing students to discharge the offices of life with youthfulness and reputation. Anything jump out there to you? Well, that almost sounds like the ideal definition of a liberal arts education. So uh, well put. 
Yeah, and for me, what jumps off is understanding the spirit of free inquiry. Once again, that's that open curriculum. You take what you want and you pursue your own education. Brown, by the way, has done a very prodigious job at increasing their endowment. They've doubled their endowment in the last 10 years. Brown also used to be known as the poorer Ivy. It was the place where you wouldn't necessarily get as strong of an A package as you get at a Princeton or a Harvard. But that has changed considerably, especially with several gifts they got, $100 million type gifts, and especially some initiatives that they put in place for low and moderate income students. So now they are not only a no loan school, but they're no loan for all incomes. And they're actually very, very generous in their financial aid package. So close to 7,000 undergraduates attend grad, about 3,000 grad students. It's a tight 154-acre campus, 54% women, 46% men, one of the dozen or so hardest schools in the country to get into with an acceptance rate of under 7%, basically, so about 1 in 14. As far as racial diversity goes, Brown is 48.9% white, 15.9% Asian, 13.2% Latinx, 7.4% 7.4% Black slash African American, 7% multiracial, and about 11% international, and 7% unknown or undeclared. And they have a 98% retention rate, and the graduation rate is 83.6% within four years and 93.5% within five years. This is one of these schools that's going to hit you for 80th at 80K, cost of attendance. Not a big sorority or fraternity school, about one in every 11 girls would be in a sorority, one in every nine guys in a frat. And some of the strongest programs at Brown would be definitely biology, anything health science related, physics, chemistry, computer science, very strong, creative writing, public health, biomedical engineering, even that they're not really much of an engineering school, uh, biomed engineering is strong. Econometrics is a very strong program they have, applied math political science and government, and they have a very strong public policy analysis track. Um, A couple other really strong programs would be neuroscience, history, foreign languages, and geology. They do have a five-year partnership with Rhode Island School of Design, known as RISD, where you can get double degrees from both RISD, one of the best art schools in the country, as well as Brown. Not a very pre-professional school, but it is your quintessential liberal arts and sciences school. No business programs, uh, but they do have a very strong entrepreneurship major. Anything else you want to add, Dave? No, I mean, Brown speaks for itself. It's a completely outstanding school. It's been extremely popular for as long as I've known it. It is a REIT school, obviously, for even the strongest students. And if you have the privilege to get into Brown, I cannot think of anybody who I've ever known associated with Brown who regretted that decision. So Hats off if you get into Brown, and and, and I do know quite a few graduates from its uh, MD uh, combined program, and they just loved it. It was outstanding. I believe at the time that it was a six or seven year program. Is it has it expanded to eight now, Mark? Or is yeah, it still it's a seven eight year program. Okay. It's an so eight it, yeah, it's, yes. It's an so used to it used to be you could shave off one of those years, but but even so, the ability to have such an open curriculum and still have one of the most rigorous biomedical undergraduate experiences is truly unique. So great school. I'm working with a few students right now that that's kind of their dream school. Do Plumy, do BSMD, go to Brown, and it's at the top of the list. So right. um, we'll see yeah. what happens. Yeah. Well, Dave, I got to go, man, because I got to go check out this NBA news, man. I mean, well, this is like, that was like a dagger right in my heart. That's how I chill and unwind. And now I've got to watch reruns on my DVR of LeBron taking down Giannis and LeBron taking down Kawhi that I taped both games. Well, well you know, to, my that, fix. to that point, just this weekend, both you and I watched both of those games and I think things are heating up. And on a serious note, you know, it's unfortunate because those are huge escapes for both of us. Uh, whenever life gets a little too rough or the policy is still a little too crazy, Mark will often say to me, you know what? I'm, I'm not doing anything but the NBA this weekend. <laughs> so, Yeah, I, no no politics. Yeah, no no politics, politics, just the NBA. So 
Man, the coronavirus has taken over the world. It's the Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> I can't escape Now, it. just please don't cancel this NCAA tournament, you know, which uh, I guess by the time this goes live, you know, we'll know what's going on because it's like well, Sunday is this Sunday. I'm, well, what I'm hearing now, they're talking about playing in front of no crowds, but not canceling. That's right. It's not going to be canceled, but there's going to be no crowds. Mm-hmm. But you got to think that that's really got to affect the whole nature of the tournament. Uh, I mean, the whole Cinderella story, it, they feed off so much of the energy. So Yeah, uh, but I, I, I can still watch a game, at least if it's no crowds. It's not the same as game canceled. I can, I can yeah. deal with that, but I'm being selfish here. I'm thinking about myself. I should be thinking yeah. about everybody, everybody else, which is more important. So anyway, Dave, have safe travels. Don't you take off first thing in the morning for Asheville? The first thing in the morning, and uh, hopefully I don't get stuck in some quarantine zone. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm still mad. You're going to fly in Atlanta, man. Take me to steak dinner. We we're going to hang out. But I understand <laughs> you. You're going straight to Asheville this week. I'll probably catch you sometime soon. Um, but um, safe travels, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. You take care. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. Your College Bound Kid is produced by Dave Visaya of PodcastEngineers.com. If you find this podcast helpful, it would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send this to someone you know that can really use this information. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Our image editor is Tauha Khan. Webmaster is Stallianos Dimitru. And marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. And if you want to get a copy of the book, 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, you can go right to 171answers.com. And if you want to have a college coaching session with Mark, you can send him a text to area code 404-664-4340. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like to ask us, and we'll include them on the show. You can just email us at questions with an S at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions. So send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, yourcollegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in and we look forward to meeting with you again next week. <laughs>